All right, next we have uh, John Keats from Wakeamp um, to talk about proxy wasm with this TO is half baked, but works great. Thanks, John. All right, let's see. I've got to make sure that I, oh, this is tricky. Yep, almost. There we go. And let me do presenter view in here. All right. Does the clicky click thing work? Yes, excellent. So, hello, uh, everyone. Small audience, but that's fine. Um, my name is John. Uh, I will do uh, uh, a quick introduction so you have some context as to why we're using ProxyWasm at all and how we got to uh, using that as a solution to our problem. Um, we'll work our way through uh, the problem context, uh, through Istio a little bit, just in case you don't know what Istio is, and then uh, towards ProxyWasm. And if there's any room at the end, then uh, we might have some Q&A if someone has questions. So, uh, first a little bit about me. Uh, I've been around uh, in the technology world for a while, and I've been doing everything inside of software, hardware, uh, whatever you can imagine. I started as uh, sysops and sysadmin stuff, but at some point you want more. Before you know it, you're doing software engineering, architecture, and uh, yeah, at some point you end up at Wacom doing microservices architecture, which is pretty cool. Um, and if you need to find me later on, I'm at John Keats pretty much everywhere. So, uh, Wacom is an e-commerce company. Uh, for people in the Netherlands, they will probably know Wacom. For people outside of the Netherlands, you probably not have any clue what Wacom is. Uh, so I've stolen this uh, slide from our corporate uh, slide deck. Uh, there's one thing that's not listed in here, and that's uh, we have quite a vertical integration. So we have our own uh, logistics centers, and we have our own software engineering teams and our own infrastructure engineering teams. So uh, I've been told that for, well, a Dutch-sized company, that's somewhat unusual, but it works pretty uh, great for us. Um, Wacom has been around for a bit. Uh, this is also uh, just a copy from our corporate deck. Um, but uh, uh, while this is what the outside world sees, uh, if we look at it from a technology history, then we started with a bunch of non-technology, because, well, it's the 50s, so what you're going to do? There's not much technology. Uh, but you scale up your business, uh, and at some point you will need technology, such as punch cards, which go into these machines, which are mainframes. And from that point forward, uh, because this was, of course, the whole new technology back then, uh, it will at some point become legacy. Now, this was around the 70s somewhere, so of course it's legacy. Um, but uh, legacy is also what caused us to look for something to fix a very specific problem in our traffic management. And, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, that's where the problem arises. So, right now, we are moving from Mesos to Kubernetes. Uh, we have a Mesos-based platform that's been around since about 2014. Uh, it's all custom, because at that stage, there wasn't any publicly available technology to do what we needed to do. Um, and uh, while that has served as well, it's kind of getting old. Uh, it's hard to maintain. The Apache Software Foundation at some point was like, well, Maybe we'll put your uh, software in the attic so it doesn't get any software updates, security updates, anything like that anymore. So that would be somewhat scary for us. So we wanted to move to Kubernetes, um, but uh, we didn't want to essentially say, hey, business, uh, you have to go uh, in a feature freeze for a year and uh, we're going to build something new. Uh, that's not realistic. And uh, what we did is we talked to a bunch of people and we came up with a bunch of rules. For example, everything that currently works needs to keep working. So both on the old platform and the new platform. That also means that when a developer delivers their CI results, which is usually a Docker image, uh, we need to still be able to ingest that. And uh, then the platform has to make sure that your service, when deployed, is actually reachable. So uh, those are pretty important rules, uh, because if you don't, then, well, everyone's going to be very sad or very mad. Now, the other rules are don't make anything worse, which is more like a quality control and scope keep creep control rule. It means that uh, it's okay to port something over that's not super nice. Um, for example, plain text credentials in GitHub repositories, which everyone has done at least once in their lifetime. Um, but if you try to fix everything at once, then your project will never end. Uh, so we, it's kind of like the inverse of what it says there, but that's the rule that we've written down because that sounds a whole better if you're presenting it to management. Uh, and then uh, the last one is also very important. Uh, don't make everyone rewrite their code. So what we also can do is we are not the largest company in the world, but we have about 350 microservices. And what we can do is ask all the teams, hey, all that code that you ever produced, make sure that it works on the new platform as well. That's not something that we can ask of them. 
uh, we don't have the manpower, and we don't have the money. So, with these rules in mind, we um, figured out, well, uh, and this is about the traffic part, so we don't have to like take a five-hour walk about all the other things that you do in your platform. But uh, we essentially uh, went shopping for a replacement for our traffic part. So uh, we didn't have that much experience in Kubernetes and the cloud-native sphere and all the projects that are uh, around. Um, so we essentially found Istio after a little bit of uh, searching and testing. Now, if we look at the legacy traffic, which is what we have to uh, uh, keep alive, essentially, um, we have a somewhat normal flow. I mean, your browser goes to Cloudflare, Cloudflare goes to a load balancer in AWS, and it then goes into OpenResty. And OpenResty is essentially Nginx with a whole bunch of Lua in it. Um, and, uh, well, we only have one Lua developer, uh, and this was built before my time, but I'm also the only one who can apparently maintain it. So that's risky and problematic. Um, but that OpenResty gateway does a whole bunch of important stuff, and then it forwards it to HA proxy, which again gets its feed of what, what services exist and where they exist in a custom manner. It's also not great because, well, who gets to maintain that? We do. And it doesn't add any bill. Uh, the, the reason why you maintain something is because it adds a value, like to your team, to your business. But this, I mean, now, this is standard. Service discovery, pretty much every package has that. So the reason that we're doing that custom, still, is because, well, in 2012, 2014, there was no other way. This was the way. So we need to make sure that uh, uh, these, these, these custom things, that the microservice that receives the traffic doesn't have to change itself in order to keep receiving traffic. So we take what we have in this picture and we turn it into a shopping list. Uh, so we know what features we, at the very minimum, need to support. And because the shopping list is just, oh, if you sit in a group of people and a whiteboard and you create a shopping list, you get something like this. This is, of course, not something that is going to deliver you any results if you plug it into Google or plug it into the CNCF landscape. So what did we do? We turn it into some more generic terms. And if you take these generic terms and you compare it with what is available in Istio, you get a pretty good match. Now, what is not matched is your authentication layer, and I'll talk about that a little bit, and the self-serve configuration, because our old configuration relied on having a very long Docker label in your image, and that would then get parsed during deployment, and that would contain your traffic configuration, which is so non-standard that nothing ever supports it. But we're going to cheat a little bit because we don't have time to talk about that, so we're going to pretend that that's okay as well. Now, the authentication layer, that's happening between these two parts, so the RESTy container and the microservice container. So the open RESTy container, it uh, essentially has a job of ingesting traffic, which comes from, from the outside world, into your cluster. And what it does is it uh, sees, like, hey, there's a JSON web token coming in. Uh, I want to make sure that that is a valid token. And if it is valid, then we're going to extract some information from that token, and we're going to put it in HTTP headers, which means that then your microservice, all it needs to do to know for which customer it needs to serve some response, it just checks the headers. Headers contain your customer number, easy peasy. Uh, not very secure, I might add. So this is something that uh, uh, was grown essentially out of habit. Um, but this functionality, exactly as it is pictured here, uh, needs to be re-implemented in Istio. Now, Istio is a very pretty cool traffic mesh system, um, but this is too custom to do with just pure configuration. So Istio does support JSON web tokens, and it does support header manipulation just by using configuration uh, uh, elements. But what it uh, doesn't do is doing it with JSON web tokens that are not entirely standard and with uh, validation methods that are also not entirely standard because they were old, essentially. So Istio is a service mesh, which means that for every service that you have, you also get a, uh, uh, an Envoy proxy that's delivered with your service. So the blue box essentially is a Kubernetes pod, and whenever one of those spins up, because you say, well, I want service A, give me a pod. And then the pod starts up, and Istio says, hey, wait a second, I'm see, you know, seeing a pod uh, appear here. We're going to add a proxy, and we're going to reconfigure your network. So everything your service A and your service B does has to go through the proxy, which means that you can monitor all the traffic, you can manipulate all the traffic, you can reroute, you can do whatever you want. You're essentially the boss of all the traffic. Now, it does a whole bunch of other very cool things, um, but this is the main part. The proxy can do whatever you want to the traffic. Now, this proxy also lives inside the ingress gateway. So when you use Istio and you want to ingest traffic from the outside world, 
you use your in ingress gateway. And this is a very helpful picture from Banzai Cloud, so I didn't have to make it. And it shows the uh, uh, essentially uh, all the users on the outside, all the services on the inside, and this box where every bit of traffic gets squeezed through. Which means if we want to do anything with the authentication, that's where it needs to happen. Now, what do we use? We use proxy wasm. Why do we use proxy wasm? Because the uh, Envoy proxy uh, is written in C++, and we're not very good at that. Um, it has a filter architecture, which is also written in C++, which we are still not very good at. Um, and it comes pre-delivered with a bunch of filters that almost do what we need, but not entirely. But it also has this very special filter called the proxy wasm filter, which allows you to manipulate your traffic using proxy wasm. Now, a little bit about proxy wasm itself. Uh, there have been a bunch of talks about wasm. So uh, very quickly, it's essentially uh, a flash player, but uh, better. Uh, it is in your browser. Uh, uh, at least that was the start of it. Um, so you run binary programs in your browser. It sounds a bit like Java applets, but um, it's better, I promise. And uh, instead of doing it in a JavaScript runtime or scripting engine, it's running inside of a virtual machine. And that also means that uh, you can essentially use any language that you can compile into WebAssembly bytecode can run inside that virtual machine, which is pretty great. It means that instead of having one language and you have to transpile it, for example, TypeScript to JavaScript, you don't have to do that. You just use whatever language you want, as long as it supports compiling to bytecode. Now, and it is very fast, so of course someone had to do it. You take DOSBox, you recompile it into WebAssembly, and then you run your WebAssembly DOSBox in a browser, and then you install Windows 95 inside your browser, which is possible. It's not super useful, but it should give you an idea that it's very fast and very performant and very capable. Now, if we look at the proxy part of proxy wasm, uh, it is essentially an ABI, so an application binary interface, which means that uh, as long as you adhere to the standard, you can use this, this, this specification. So on the Envoy side, uh, you have the WASM filter, which implements the host side, sort of virtual machine with the API that you need in order to use these modules. And on the module side, you have to use WebAssembly, but just not you know, random WebAssembly, you need to need specifically proxy WASM API compatible WebAssembly, which is slightly different. And that comes to back to bytes in the ass, so we'll get to that as well. Now, what happens is that your filter or your Proxy starts up, it loads its configuration for all its filters, and you have many filters in theory. And one of the filters might be a WebAssembly filter. So it then loads it dynamically, so not statically pre-compiled or inside the container. So you can literally just give it a little bit of configuration, like, hey, uh, this is where you can find your WASM module. And uh, if you import it, you have to use it as a filter at this stage. So you can even specify when it needs to happen. Now, this is all very nice. This is how essentially Proxy WASM fits in the whole puzzle. But if we uh, look at how you are supposed to use it, you get slightly limited options. That's because ProxyWasm, and this is just a screenshot from their GitHub repository where the spec is maintained, it currently only has SDKs for a couple of languages, and it only has a couple of host environments. So in the SDK list, uh, we're like, well, we have to pick one of those, and we're definitely not going to pick C++, uh, and we're not going to go choose Zig, because we don't know anyone who knows Zig, so that's kind of problematic. Um, so yeah, we have to choose one of the others. Um, but what is very nice is that uh, Envoy Proxy and Istio, which is essentially just Envoy, so I don't know why it's listed twice, but they're listed here. They're like, well, this is definitely going to work. So when we discovered that it was possible, we went into the spec, and then we discovered that, well, there's a bunch of language, some of the which we know, and it supports our proxy, which is also great. So this might be our solution, to have this custom authentication thing inside our Ingress Gateway, and then nobody has to rewrite their service. So that's pretty nice. So. Uh, you click on the proxy wasm go SDK link as you do, and you end up in this repository which is maintained by Tetrate Labs, which I think is also a sponsor and has been around for a while. They do all sorts of cool traffic things. Um, but, uh, well, we do know a bit of Go, and uh, we just wanted to know, you know, how easy is this to use? Is this something that we need to, I don't know, take a 12-hour course for or something? So we go to the repository, we find this nice examples directory, and what do you do with examples? You try them out. So one of the examples, and if you're not a software developer, don't worry, I'll just very quickly explain what's happening here. Um, the examples, in this case, a uh, request header example, uh, what they have is a bit of code, and this is slightly modified so it fits in the slide. Um, but uh, what essentially happens is you define a function, in this case, on HTTP request headers, which means that you essentially tell ProxyWasm, like, hey, if uh, you reach my filter and you have headers, this is the function that you're supposed to call. 
And, uh, well, that's what it will do when you load the filter. And what we then do is we say, hey, ProxyWasm, give me all the requ request headers that you have. So you get a list of all the headers, the, uh, uh, the key value pairs, essentially. Um, but not much else, so it doesn't do any nice fancy decoding for you. Uh, then uh, below that, there's a little bit of an error check, just to make sure that you actually did get any headers. And below that, there's a for loop where we essentially say, this list of headers, this is nice, I want to have all the headers in this list, and we'll print them out into the log. Uh, so it doesn't actually do anything with the headers, it just shows you that the filter was loaded and that it knows how to read the headers. And then at the bottom we say actually continue, which essentially says, hey proxy wasm, I'm done, you can continue with your normal proxy business. So we tried this out, compiled it, you know, the tracking service in the readme, uh, the readme says uh, copy this, paste that, run this, and well, suddenly you have a wasm module. You load it into a uh, standalone Envoy container, just on your local machine, nothing fancy. And indeed, it works. You get your uh, request headers logged into your log file. So what this tells you is that as a, uh, from an engineer perspective, that your engineering loop is complete. You have your code, you have your compiler, you can load it, you can test it, and you can send traffic through it. So that's pretty neat. So that gives us a lot of confidence, like, well, uh, this is easy, this is going to work for everything. We're immediately going to build, like, uh, 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 the bestest uh, authentication layer ever. Well, of course, uh, that's not how it works, because what happens is that you have your, um, uh, your token, your JSON web token, which is, of course, encoded, like the name suggests, in JSON. Uh, what happens when you try to decode and encode JSON in uh, the proxy Go SDK? Uh, it doesn't work, because the uh, SDK requires that you use TinyGo, not the full version of Go. And TinyGo, which was originally developed for microcontrollers, uh, doesn't support a whole bunch of things, including lots of reflection. Uh, and reflection uh, doesn't necessarily matter if you don't know what it is, but what does matter is that it's not supported, but it is required if you want to do any JSON stuff with the standard Go JSON library. So uh, could we avoided this? Uh, we could have avoided this because it's in the documentation, but we didn't read the documentation. So that was, uh, well, our fault. Um, but we figured, uh, well, what if we just don't use reflection, and what if we just don't use any uh, uh, of the standard built-in libraries? So I mean, how hard could it possibly be? Well, it's very hard, because you have all sorts of text. This is a screenshot from the jwt.io website. It's a very useful website if you want to know a little bit about the tokens. Um, it starts out as some basics for encoded string. You decode that into uh, JSON text, and then the JSON text gets marshaled into a struct. So that's how you, uh, from the outside in, you take what's in the HTTP protocol, and through a few steps, you get an object that you can actually use in your code, which is important. Otherwise, what you're going to do, you don't have any way to interact with your token. So there's quite some variability in here. You can uh, have your uh, tokens be, for example, malformed, or you can have them very large or very small. You can have very different types of tokens. So when we tried to make a parser, because, well, uh, what do you do? Reinvent the wheel, because that's always a smart idea. Um, but it just doesn't work very well. It's not very performant, and it usually just breaks. And we're like, well, this is not something that we can ever take into production. So what do we do? Uh, well, we look around, and we try to find if someone else has had this problem because we're not some unique company in the world. I mean, there are many companies and many people who use JSON. So we looked around and we figured out that uh, there are many reasons why other people use JSON libraries that are not based on reflection, primarily for speed. So it apparently uh, uh, is like 100 megabytes per second difference if you use a late JSON library that doesn't use reflection. Um, that means for us that we can use such a library that doesn't use reflection in our tiny Go runtime. So that's pretty nice. So that solves our JSON problem. Now, we didn't end up with specifically tiny JSON. We used the JSON iterator, because there's always a trade-off. So the native Go JSON library that you, but we try to import in ProxyWasm, uh, it has a very nice way, a very um, uh, ergonomic, developer-friendly way of uh, parsing and using JSON. Um, these other libraries, they don't. They usually require you to do something very specific, like manually describing in your code how you go from a text-based uh, input to a struct or object that you can actually use yourself. Um, and some of them try uh, to help you a little bit by pre-generating some code, but when you move from the standard library to a different library, well, it's a trade-off. Trade-off in size, in speed, in ergonomics. But it's fine. I mean, it's just a bunch of JSON tokens. As long as it works, we're happy. So on we go into the, uh, uh, the actual uh, logic that we have to implement. So you get yourself a cookie, comes in, got this big, very long base64 encoded string, 
We take the string and we decode it into text. We take the text and we decode it into a JSON web token object that we can use in our code. And on the side, there's a little bit of text on the, on the left side that contains uh, the header of the token and it contains a key ID. And then from our environment variables, we inject a JSON web key set. And that contains also basic for and JSON encoded a list of keys that we know. So that allows us to match the key ID of the incoming token to the key ID of the keys that we know. Do we have a match? We continue. If we don't have a match, we say, well, we can't validate the token, so it's going to be invalid by default. But if we have a key, that's nice. We can uh, verify the signature, and uh, if it's valid, uh, we can do all sorts of other logic like, has the timer expired? Is this a token that's five years old? Well, then maybe we don't accept it. Um, but this one is the important bit. Why is it the important bit? Because we tried it, and uh, well, uh, it turns out that uh, you can't just read cookies in, uh, in uh, the tiny Go, because reading cookies in Go requires that you use the net slash HTTP package. That package requires that you have crypto slash TLS, and that package doesn't work in tiny Go because it doesn't work in proxy wasm. So that means that we can't use that, that package, and parsing cookies is not something most people would enjoy. It's almost at the same level as trying to work with dates and times in code. It's not a lot of fun. So we did hack around a little bit. So we just went to the source code of the NetHP package. And we were like, well, read cookies. It doesn't sound like it should be using TLS. Maybe the code is standalone and we can just steal it. And that's what we did. We just steal the read cookies code. Works like a charm. Excellent. Problem solved. Except, no, not problem solved. Because the next step, and we should have known this, because if TLS isn't supported, then AES and RSA are probably also not supported. And we should, have, of course, read the documentation, but um, yeah, we use RSA, but not supported, RSA. So yeah, that's a problem. No RSA, no tokens. So that means that no matter how hard we're going to hammer on this, and we're not going to implement our own RSA encryptor and decryptor, that will be the worst of all worlds. Um, so now what? Um, well, turns out um, we can't use Go. So that's a bit of a bummer because that's the language we had the most knowledge and the most affinity with. So we essentially just uh, had to go back to the SDK page, pick something else. So uh, Zig and C++, they were out. Go, also out. Assembly script, it looked very weird and very not ready for prime time yet. We also tried it out a little bit and it just broke at every turn, so also not an option. So you end up with the crab, also known as the Rust programming language. Now, the Rust programming language um, is uh, slightly different than what we're used to. Um, however, it also has a very big community and it um, is very active, very well maintained. And also for some reason very opinionated. Um, but yeah, that wasn't a problem for us because we, uh, we figured, well, we really do want this solution because this seems like the best solution for us. I mean, if we manage to fix this, nobody has to rewrite the service, we can migrate, everybody happy. And um, it worked. And we don't have like a billion slides with a billion lines of code to show you that it worked, because then we will be here for another hour. But um, as long as you make sure that you do not import SSL, it works. It just works natively. You don't need to do any special things, you don't need to jump through hoops. You just import the packages and crates that you need, you compile it, everything works, except for some reason, pretty much every package tries to sneak OpenSSL into the dependencies, which is not very great because it doesn't work. And why doesn't it work? Well, probably for the same reason that the AES implementation of Go doesn't work, because for cryptographic operations, they usually have assembly-based uh, optimizations, so you can make use of all the fancy instructions that processors have. Uh, those instructions, they do not exist in the WebAssembly virtual machine. I think someone is working on it uh, in the web crypto standard, but right now, it doesn't exist. So, uh, yeah, the only way to work around that is to disable OpenSSL wherever you can. Go to crates.io to find out if any of the packages you have is trying to sneak in OpenSSL and just not use them. And for some uh, libraries, and this is something that we learned and we really liked about Rust, uh, you can select what dependencies you will enable. So you can have features in your crates that you enable or disable, and based on that, it will just not import dependencies. So it's pretty neat. Um, so, yeah, that worked out great. Um, so what did we learn at the end? Proxy Wasm. Like the slide says, and like the title says, it's great because it's very performant. I mean, this thing is like at native speed. It's not normally when you have a, a, a scripting language or a plugin language, everything slows down. This native speed, we can do it faster than in Lua, which is always great because that's where we're coming from. 
Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing, but support somewhat limited. So sometimes you have to jump languages from Go to Rust, maybe assembly script one day. And uh, it appears that the higher your level, lang higher level your language is, the more problematic it gets. But the lower level your language is, the less problems you have because apparently uh, they have the ability to compile their code in such a way that if it notices that some instructions are not available, it'll just not use them. Go will not notice this because Go will just say, I'm going to use assembly whether you like it or not. And that doesn't work. So yeah, uh, and also there's a tiny, tiny bug at the end. Uh, when, uh, when you load a WASM module in Istio, uh, you cannot unload it. So if you want to replace it or you want to remove it, you actually have to uh, change your configuration and then restart your proxy. I think they're working on that, not entirely sure. And of course, if you don't read the documentation, you're gonna have a bad time. That was my talk, thank you. <laughs> if there are any questions or feedback, I would love to hear something. Uh, any questions? Um, I have one actually. So, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that you moved from Mesos to Kubernetes. Yeah. I'm curious to know how many clusters you had in Mesosphere versus how many you ended up in Kubernetes. Right. So, that's an interesting one. Uh, we had, um, I think, about 12 Mesos clusters, uh -huh. and we moved to 50 Kubernetes clusters. Wow. And we did that because uh, uh, the team that we did this was only three people, including me. Uh, so, we at the beginning of everything, we said, well, the only way we are ever going to do this is with 100% automation. So that means that we, uh, we use Terraform a lot and a lot of other technologies, and that means that we, at the start of the creation of a uh, cluster, so we have a system namespace, which you call Atlas, that's the platform. And then within that, you can have smaller namespaces for each different brand, for back office, front office, whatever. And within those namespaces, you have environments. So that means uh, if uh, you need to create an additional environment in an, existing na uh, in an existing namespace, it's just you add one additional line in Terraform, and if you create your AWS account, it will allocate you a network, you will get an EKS cluster on AWS, it will create an Argo CD uh, entry for you, you can create a GitHub repository for you where your manifests are uh, stored, and it will create a secondary GitHub uh, repository for you where your workload manifests are stored, so they are separated. Um, and by doing it that way, uh, you can very easily spin up clusters. Uh, it was very important to us. Yeah, and all 50 Kubernetes clusters yep. are pets. Pets. Yep, so you can destroy them and nothing happens. So they are stateless. Uh, one Kubernetes cluster equals one AWS account, and uh, nobody is allowed to add anything except that Kubernetes cluster in that AWS account. So oh, our so data... they're cattle, they're, they're yeah. replaceable. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so they're not pets. Yeah, no, sorry, yeah. I, I get it. Yeah, no, they are, um, uh, yeah, they are, they're cattle. Mm -hmm. And what happens is um, we actually made it even more cattle-ish. Um, we have a controlling uh, environment, uh, which is also stateless, and that one controls where your deployments happen. And then that can go to any number of clusters. So our workload clusters, they, uh, for example, we have prod, but we don't have one prod. You can have 10 prods if you want, and your service can deploy to one of the 10 prods or to all of them. It's up to the developer. If the developer says, well, my service is very important, needs to be highly available, what do you do? You deploy all of them. And if one cluster goes away, well, that's fine. Yeah. So uh, we also don't, well, we are testing the EKS in-place upgrades because AWS says that it works, and yes, it does work. But I think for us, it's more important to never upgrade, to just replace, because yeah. it means that you also verify your disaster recovery. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we need to make sure that it's proven. So every time, anytime someone in the company says, oh, we'll just do an in-place upgrade, they're like, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to destroy everything, because that's how you prove that it works. Yeah, yeah. You might be interested in um, Anne's lightning yeah. talk later today about uh, just-in-time clusters, but yeah. you won't take any yeah. more of your time. <laughs> any other questions? I do have a question. Was it information density okay? Was the speed okay? Was it too fast, too slow? Too many slides, too little? All right. All right. Uh, you, you never know. Sometimes people say that I talk too much or try to deliver too much information, which is probably true, but all right. Good to hear. Thank you. Thanks.